Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner. Uh, we're doing section 5.12, example 2 in Griffith's Introduction to Electrodynamics, book 2. This is cycloid, mo cycloid motion. I'll write that down. If we had our B pointing out of the page, let me use that purple again. So, B vector pointing out of the page uniformly, okay? And we put a particle somewhere on that page. Let's put it bloop right there. Okay, it's not going to move. We already discussed that um, magnitude of charge is Q. Okay. However, if we had an electric field that's perpendicular to the B vector, so let's say it's pointing straight up. I'm using orange because electricity comes from the word uh, for amber in, in Greek, I believe. So electric field is pointing up then this stationary particle is initially going to experience some kind of force that, that pushes it up. And as it begins to move, the magnetic field, uh, will, uh, interacting with the velocity of that, of that charged particle, will cause it to experience a force, QV cross B, pointing this way. And so it's going to rotate around until it starts to move against the electric field, and then it'll slow down. And the question is, what path does this follow? So they give the answer away in the book, um, if you look at it. So just kind of divert your eyes from there for a moment. And we're going to do the math on our own. Okay, so our B vector is going to be B in the K hat direction. So K hat is coming out of the page. This is different than the book. So let's do, let's see, I hat has to point to the right and J hat has to point up. And our E vector is equal to E in the J hat direction. Okay, and then our force on that particle is given by the Lorentz uh, force law, which is Q E vector plus V vector cross B vector. Okay, what's this Q V vector cross B vector stuff? Well, we can draw it over here, I hat, J hat, K hat, and the V vector comes first. So the interesting thing is that the only forces that are, there's never going to be a force pointing in the K hat direction. So we don't have to worry about that one. Uh, so we have the X, Y time derivatives, first time derivative, that's a dot x dot is equal to dx by dt. It's probably unfamiliar to some of you. Uh, I think uh, Newton was the one that popularized that notation when he introduced um, calculus. And the b vector is pointing in the k hat direction, so it's 0, 0, b. And so we take the, the this is this b, y dot in the i hat direction, plus, let's see, j will have 0, minus bx dot in the j hat direction. Okay, so that's v cross b. That's v cross b. Just a simple cross product there. Okay, so let's substitute all that in. The e vector is e hat is e in the j hat direction plus b y dot in the i hat direction plus b x dot in the j hat direction. And that's going to be equal to mass times acceleration. Okay, that's a vector. All right, so let's combine some terms here. So mass times acceleration, what's mass? So that's mass times, let's see, are we going to get any acceleration in the k hat direction? No, so it's zero k hat. Are we going to ever get acceleration in the x or the y direction? The answer is yes, so we have the x double dot in the i hat direction plus y double dot in the j hat direction. I barely pulled that one off. Okay, so for the i hat direction we have uh, m x double dot is equal to uh, q b this is not right actually this minus that. So this is a minus. Minus. Okay. Q, B, Y dot, okay? And the other equation we get in the J hat direction is we get M, 
y double dot is equal to q e minus q b x dot. Okay, that's that that goes there. This goes there. Okay, so there's our two equations. Um, we have uh, two variables with different time derivatives. What we can do is take the time derivative of this side. Actually, let's do this first. x equals q b over m. And this q b over m is going to appear a lot. And I'm going to give it the name of uh, omega. Yes, q b over m is omega. So this is equal to omega. That, and we can do the same thing over here. Let's see, q b over m. Well, that would have to be uh, omega e over b, right? Because it's divided through by m. And then this is just omega x dot. Okay? All right, so x double dot is equal to that, y double dot is equal to that. Okay, so if we take the time derivative of this, we get the triple dot um, is equal to omega times the double dot. And then we substitute this over there. So we get x triple dot over omega is equal to omega times e over b minus x single dot. Okay, these two make a square. Okay, and now we scratch our heads and say, what could x possibly be? Well, the fact that the third time derivative equals something times the first time derivative suggests that we're going to have sines and cosines. Um, and you can see this omega squared that comes out. So take the derivative twice of a sine or cosine, you get back what you originally had in a negative um, times whatever coefficient you had on the inside there. So we're going to take a stab and we're going to say x is equal to some constant times um, cosine omega t plus some other constant times sine omega t. And this one right here, so we basically have to somehow cancel that out. So we're going to add an e over b t term. And then we have a third constant hanging out there somewhere. Okay. And the y direction, okay, you can figure this out because, where'd my y dot go? y dot, y double dot. Okay, the, oh, we take x double dot. Where did we get that? We substitute something in. Um, so if, if we plugged this into this equation, yes, that'll, actually, this, let's do this, this one into this equation. This will do it, this will do it better. Okay, so we have, m times the second derivative. So this is uh, c1 omega squared cosine omega t, and we have a negative sign there, minus c2 omega squared sine omega t is equal to, oh, I should have used this version right here, omega times y dot. So the y derivative is equal to this. Okay, divide through by w, so we get or omega, not w. So we get, um, the first derivative of y is this, so we can just you know take a step backwards and see what y used to be, and so we had a c2 cosine because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and that's the omega there that we get from the out inside, a minus c1 sine omega 2 plus some c4. Okay, so we have these two equations. We have the boundary conditions that at x of zero was equal to zero and y at zero was equal to zero. Also in the beginning it was at rest so the first derivatives are also zero. Okay. The next bit is we basically apply these equations to these things. Well what does x of zero equal zero imply? Well that, let's use this green one. Um, well, when cosine of zero, that's one, but sine of zero is zero, right? Um, and this is gonna be zero. So we basically get C1 is equal to negative C3. Because zero equals C1 plus C3. So C1, they have to be opposites of each other. And we get a similar story here, except this time C2. So this one says that C2 
has to equal negative C4, right? Now the first derivatives, um, did I write an equation for the first derivatives? I should do that. Let's write that out right now. So the first derivative of x is equal to C1 omega sine omega t, that's a negative, plus C2 omega cosine omega t plus e over b. Okay? And the first derivative here, and I'm kicking myself, so don't worry, C2 minus C2 omega sine omega t minus C1 omega cosine omega t. And I think we actually had it written down here. Yeah, we did, but now it's a little bit more neater. Okay, so the first derivative is zero at zero. So what does that imply? Well, this term becomes zero. That becomes C2 omega. So C2 omega has to equal negative e over b omega, right? And so y dot of zero, so that means negative C2 omega is equal to zero, so C2. Well, C2 is equal to zero, C4 is equal to zero, so that's zero, that's zero, that's zero, okay? And that's just negative C1, okay? Um, we're almost there. Um, we had calculated that, wait, this isn't right, it's not C2. This is not correct. Zero, one, you would be, okay, I did something silly here. Uh, let's do this one more time. Where'd all my fancy notes go? Okay. Let's walk through this one more time. So x is equal to C1 cosine omega t plus C2 sine omega t plus e over b t plus c3. x dot is equal to negative c1 omega sine omega t plus c2 omega cosine omega t plus e over b. Okay, y is equal to uh, c2 cosine of omega t minus c1 sine of omega t plus some constant c4 and y dot is equal to negative c2 omega sine omega t plus c1 omega cosine omega t and the c4 drops off. Okay, and then we had x of zero equals zero, x dot of zero equals zero, y of zero equals zero, y dot of zero equals zero. Okay, so let's follow this one more time. Okay, when x is zero, Cosine is 1, 0, 0. So we have C1 plus C3 has to equal 0. So we have C1 equals negative C3. Okay? This one, 0, that's E over B. So this says C2 equals negative E over B omega. Okay. This one, y of 0 is 0, says that c2 equals negative c4. Okay? And this one, y of 0 is 0, ah, says c1 is actually 0, because that becomes 0. That's why I did it wrong. I said c2 is 0 when c1 is equal to 0. Um, so those are all zeros. So the new equation we get looks like this. So x is equal to c1 is 0, c2 is negative e over b omega um, of sine omega t plus e over b t, and c3 is 0, and y is equal to c2 which is negative this, so negative e over b omega cosine omega t zero. What's c4? Plus e over b omega, because c2 is negative c4. Okay, and we can rewrite these equations into this simple form, which looks an awfully lot like what you see in the book. So we have um, 
this first term. So we're going to take everything and times by e over omega b. So we have to add an omega t minus sine omega t. Uh, so we did the same thing down here, e over omega b. So we have 1 minus cosine omega t. Okay. Now the, the trick that he does now is he says, okay, we're going to use r as equal to e over omega b. So this is r and this is r. Okay. And then he says, let's use, take advantage of the sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1 rule. So he's going to rewrite. Um, so we have x minus r omega t is equal to sine r sine omega t and then y minus r is equal to r cosine omega t and square it so you get x minus r omega t squared that's an r is equal to r squared sine squared and then y minus r squared is equal to r squared cosine squared and then you add these two equations to each other, and so you get x minus r omega t squared plus y minus r squared. So we're just going to add these together is equal to, so we have an r squared we can factor out, and then sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. Okay, now let's look at this equation. This is the gold shot right here. This is the equation for da, 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 a circle. Okay except the center of the circle isn't at 0, 0, it's at y equals r and x equals this thing. The x component is changing. Okay, and so going back to our original diagram, which we've kind of screwed up, okay, so what we have is we start off with the circle at time 0, the center of the circle is right here, okay, and then we're going to draw a circle as it goes around like this, but the center is moving at the same speed that circle is rotating, so we end up with this. And I can't nearly draw it as well as the book does. Okay, it's called a cycloid motion. Okay, it's basically what happens to a dot on the rim of a bicycle wheel. Okay, so and how fast is it moving? Just r omega is the speed that it's moving. And what's r omega? Well, r omega, r is e over omega b, so it's e over b. Okay, so the speed it's moving at is just e over b. And that's amazing. That's really weird motion that you get from just putting a particle into a field. Um, with uh, electric and magnetic uh, fields that are perpendicular to each other. It just goes boop, 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 boop um, at a certain speed proportional to E and anti-proportional to the magnetic field. Thanks for your time. Share this with your friends um, and let me know if I made any mistakes. Thanks. Bye.